Kalimera says, good morning. Today, of course, is St. Alexios Day. But it's also St. Patrick Day. <laughs> Which is why I'm wearing green vestments today in honor of St. Patrick. Today's gospel reading has a lot to tell us about St. Patrick, believe it or not. We hear in today's gospel, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You say, what does that have to do with St. Patrick? Well, St. Patrick lived a very interesting story, and you may have heard it, and I'm sure there are many versions of his story, but he also wrote a little biography of his own, which was unusual for his time, and we know some things from that as well. But what we do know is that he was, perhaps in the British Isles, he was captured as a, as a uh, slave and taken to Ireland. And there, though he was a young boy, he was kept as a slave for over six years. And who was this young boy? Well, he was, his grandfather was a priest. His father was a deacon. So he wasn't someone who was uh, a stranger to the holy things. But still, although he probably knew many, many prayers by heart and, and I'm sure practiced a, a very visible faith. I don't want to say he was faithless. Sometimes the stories overdo that part. <clears throat> I don't think he was faithless. He was a faithful man. But still, his faith hadn't reached the place where, it could, where we could call him a saint. So here he was as a slave, having to tend to sheep among a people whose language he, he didn't know when he got there, but he must have learned over time. And how did they treat him since he was a slave? Well, I'm sure they didn't treat him with graciousness and kindness, but they treated him as a slave. And so there he was, far from home, homesick, remembering the life he had, and, and suffering as a, as a slave and tending the sheep, and he decided that the only thing he could do to kind of medicate and uh, alleviate his sorrow was to pray. And so he began to say simple prayers to God, simple and heartfelt prayers. And he took those prayers from whatever he had learned in church, and he repeated them again and again and again. And he said in his autobiography that he reached the point where he was saying a hundred prayers in one day. And what he found out is that every step he took toward God, he felt more of God's grace fill him. So it was sort of a self-motivating kind of a thing. And so he, he continued to grow and grow and grow in prayer. And he considered that time of his slavery to be a blessing, not a curse. But anyway, having said those many prayers, at some point he decided, again, he was just a young boy, 16, 17, something like that, when he was captured. And he worked those six, again, maybe it was more years, I don't remember the exact number of years, that he was a slave. He escaped. How he escaped, only God knows, because there was oceans to cross. Did he swim across? Did he sneak into a boat and make his way across? Did he steal a boat? I have no idea. But somehow or other, he escaped, and he ended up in what was then called Gaul, so in France. It wasn't called France back then, but what we know is France. And there he went to the church, returned himself to the embrace of the church because he was living in Ireland where there was no Christian faith. And he couldn't even hear the name of Christ uh, vocalized, but instead he saw the pagan rituals and rites. And so he was so happy to be back in a place where Christ's name was glorified. And he be immediately became involved in the church, and they saw his piety, and he was ordained, I'm sure, first as a deacon, and then as a priest, and finally as a bishop. Now the years had gone by, I don't know how many, but Probably he was in his 30s at this point. So 
they, when they appointed a bishop, they said, now guess where you're going? He said, where am I going? He says, you're going to Ireland. Now remember, I said that today's gospel was going to connect us to his life. Can you imagine you have been harmed, hurt, tortured, degraded, humiliated, shamed, pulled away from your family, violently abused, and you are sent now to that place, to those people, to bring them the gospel. How are you going to do it? Well, the first thing you have to do is to forgive them. <laughs> you have to forgive all the things they did to you. In fact, he doesn't mention all of the tortures and torments he went through in his autobiography, which is very interesting. How are you going to forgive those people? Well, he must have read this verse that we are reading today. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you don't forgive them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So he heard those words and he internalized them and he realized as much as it might hurt, he had to find a way to forgive and to love the very people who had harmed him. And so he does. And that's what makes him St. Patrick, <laughs> the illuminator of Ireland. So where does he do? He goes now to Ireland. And do you think it was easy? Do you think they welcomed him? Oh, here is our hero, St. Patrick. We're so glad to see him. No, they didn't know him as St. Patrick. They knew him as the runaway slave. They were out to get him, <laughs> re-enslave him. But he, he doesn't submit to that. In fact, he preaches immediately the gospel of Christ. And he does so in their language. Because remember now, he was a slave there for so many years. He picked up a few words. And he begins to teach them. And they begin to listen. And this grace that he had of being able to forgive them gave to them a sense that this is a man who loves us. Some began to convert. But as I said earlier, it wasn't, uh, they didn't throw out petals to welcome him. He says in his autobiography that 12 times they tried to kill him. 12 different times he, they almost killed him. But by the end of his ministry there, there wasn't any place in Ireland that hadn't been converted to Christ. Now you say, well, how did they not kill him, Father Paul? I mean, after all, they were warrior people. They knew how to kill someone. Well, here's one of the stories. I don't know all the stories, again, because maybe they haven't all been told. But the one that I know is the story called the Lorica. Have you ever heard that about the Lorica? Some of you heard <laughs> Just, Just two people in my family. <laughs> well, I guess I told that story before. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to come a little closer to you. St. Patrick, this wonderful man, he, uh, he learned, he made a prayer of his own. And what did he say? I'm not going to, I don't know the whole prayer. But he said, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ in the heart of everyone who speaks to me, Christ in the ears of everyone who hears me. It's a very long prayer. But anyway, he was walking with some of his monks. By then he had monks. And uh, a group of Celtic warriors had set upon him. They, they had hidden behind a hill. And they knew he would pass that way. And they were ready to kill him. They just knew they had to get him. So they, they had their arrows <laughs> to the bow and they waited. And now, I don't know how long you can hold the bow ready, but... You know, they, maybe they took turns because they were waiting. Anytime they saw him, they were going to start to shoot him. And he, not knowing this, said the Lorica, Christ in front of me, Christ behind me, Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ in the heart of everyone who looks at me, Christ in the ears of everyone who hears me, 
and so forth. And as he walked by, they didn't see him. They didn't see him at all, or the monks. And they couldn't understand how he escaped. And later, he preached to them, and they confessed their desire to kill him. And they asked him, because they just couldn't take it, they said, how did you escape us? We were waiting for you. <laughs> how did you do it? He says, I didn't do anything. I just was praying. He says, we looked and we looked, and all we saw go by was a herd of deer. We didn't see you. So deer, I don't know the Celtic language at all, but it means something about the word deer is in the word lorica. So it's a prayer of the deer, I guess, is the, maybe the translation or some approximate translation. So the lorica was a prayer that as he said it, God cloaked him and his followers in the disguise of deer. So that here are these, isn't that ironic? These people who normally would have been happy to shoot a deer and take it home, they didn't see the deer, even though they were looking, they would have sp easily spotted a herd of deer if they were hunting deer, but they were hunting a man and they couldn't see him. All they saw were deer. And why do I tell you that story? Of course, it's his feast day. That's a good enough reason to tell you. But I tell you because you can understand from that story what is the power and the grace of forgiveness. I know we talk about St. Patrick for many things, but I don't know if we talk about him for that. How did he come to forgive those people who had hurt him so badly for so many years and given him no hope of ever returning home? How did he forgive them? But he did through his obedience to Christ. And what did Christ give him in return? Grace upon grace upon grace. And when he finally came to Ireland, that place was already made fertile from the many tears he shed and the many prayers that he said there as a slave. And when he came as a transfigured human being, having learned to love even his enemies, all the worship of demons, all the demons, uh, literal and figurative, fell down. And Ireland was made a place for Christ. So please think about that in your own life, how essential it is to forgive those who harm you and even abuse you and even ridicule you or whatever other thing they might do. Try to find a way to forgive them. And if you can, imagine the grace that God will send to you. Amen.